As we all know, the world around us is changing at lightning speed and technology is changing the way we live, learn, work and communicate. In our first round table yesterday, we discussed which skills we need to teach the young generation to prepare them for the world they will be living in, in 10 or 20 years, when many of today's jobs will be taken, will be taken over by machines and AI. Today, a practical education must prepare our students for work that does not yet exist, in a future that cannot be clearly defined. Therefore, lifelong learning will be the future of today's students, but it also needs to be the present of their teachers. With the title, Train the Teacher, Building a Culture of Continuous Learning, our last roundtable of this year's ReSchool GSA Forum focuses on you, on the teachers. Without you, none of the discussed and needed changes in education will happen. Therefore, it is a great pleasure to welcome our three experts uh, for this panel. Carolina Bergamasco uh, from Cogniter Schools. Uh, Carolina holds an MA from UCL Institute of Education. She spent several years leading K-12 teams in addition to work as a head teacher. She's currently involved in the EdTech rollout at Cogniter Schools. Welcome, Carolina. Piru Suhonen, uh, founder of ALO Finland, which offers massive open online courses, mocks on Finnish education. She's a strong believer in lifelong learning and is passionate about creativity, innovation, and global education. Welcome to Finland. And John Tate, Deputy CEO and Director of School Improvement at the Arete Learning Trust in, York, in North Yorkshire in the UK education author for Bloomsbury Education, blogger and speaker. Welcome, John. As in all our um, roundtables, each panelist will share an opening statement of up to three minutes with the initial thoughts, and then we, we get us started there. So I'm going to stop sharing and would like to ask to kick us off, Carolina. Welcome from Chile. Thank you. Thank you, Sven. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Am I already sharing my screen? Yes, you do. If okay. You, you could put Brilliant. it in presentation mode and then we yep. right we'll take it there. Okay. So train the teacher, uh, train the teacher. Um, thinking about this, uh, I thought about five building blocks uh, as part of, um, of a cycle. First of all, relationships, embracing change, collective process, clear needs, and multiple spaces of learning in order to build a culture of continuous learning. Now, what do I mean by this? In, in terms of relationship, um, the building block um, at the heart of the process is trust. We, we also need to support our teachers and also they need to feel challenged by everything we do. In the second place, multiple spaces of learning through digital platforms, uh, participating in social media, uh, teachers might be able you know, to, to learn and to connect with other professional learning uh, networks. In relation to clear needs, it's extremely important to keep our teachers engaged, empowered, and how do we do this? we do it through feedback. We need to know what their needs are. We need to know where they are. Then um, in relation to collective process, the creation of peer groups, professional communities, and being part of a global learning ecosystem. And finally, uh, embracing change. Here, it is extremely important for our teachers to adapt to the new scenarios, to use creativity as another student in the classroom, let us say, and finally, be digitally knowledgeable. That would be my part. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, Pijo, do you want to follow? Lovely. Yes, thank you, sorry. I, I just share the screen, I go continue. Thank you, Carolina, that was, that was very interesting. So there I am, uh, slideshow, there. Sven already introduced me, so I can uh, skip the first one. 
but there I am. And um, I'm going to talk more about Finnish double flip, which uh, was part, part of my master's thesis. I did fairly recently about educational technology, but more about the pedagogy side of it. And I just thought that that could um, uh, give a nice example how good learning and teaching look like in schools, in, not just in Finland, but elsewhere. And um, this was a lovely feedback from um, a principal from UK. I didn't even ask for this and he just gave it to me, so it's special. So he, he wrote to me that how to utilize the skills, innovation and abilities of students across the world as digital natives, as well as to develop global cross-cultural communication. I mean, how good is that? What else I could ask for? So these kids, they didn't just teach the whole school, the basics of, of coding, but they were a couple of um, uh, nearby schools who did bicycle trips for coding lessons. And uh, they also, they get, became sort of local celebrities. And here they are teaching um, local entre entrepreneurs and even the mayor, they are more on the other side, the basics of coding. And apparently mayor wasn't too bad at it either. And then um, I love technology, but teacher is still the best app out there. Innovation in education is still teaching and it most likely will be. There is so much stuff you can do with technology, but you need the creative teachers to really make the magic happen. And also uh, when I was doing my master's thesis, I researched uh, Flip Classroom and they, they mentioned that teacher's role is crucial when flipping or, or doing the tra traditional teaching. Otherwise, if they did not get the students the enough uh, help, the results would be quite the same. And also learning happens everywhere. This is a math lesson outside. And um, it should be, learning should be, or the education should be always holistic, not just about reading, writing, arithmetic. They are and will be important as long as we live in a written and numerical uh, world. But however, there are so many competencies that our kids need also. And to finish it off, since we've had a massive global pandemia, I hope that there's a silver lining and that tiny virus has already showed us how close and connected we are in a bad way. So hopefully the good thing is that we could come slightly closer and learn from each other a bit more. We have the technology for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pirko, for these initial words. And uh, finally, John, please go ahead. Pirko, please. Uh, perfect. Hi, uh, thank, thank you, Sven. I'm, I'm not going to present. I'm just going to talk through some of my some of my kind of Great. key uh, opening kind of comments about teacher training and about really how I think that it is, it is really so important for us to be at the cutting edge of this um, in, in, in our profession. One, one thing I want to start with is a, a statement. How can we be role models to, you know, to, to learners if we're not learners ourselves? I think that's really important to demonstrate that we are lifelong learners ourselves as teachers, just because we are um, uh, qualified or we qualified or we got our degree 15, 20 years ago, doesn't mean to say we're any more relevant than we were maybe 20 years ago. So I think it's really important to make sure we're constantly learning and we're not afraid to talk to our students and our learners about how we're still reading, how we're still learning, how we're still trying and failing and being resilient and being gritty with that because those are the exact same characteristics that we want to build in our young people. So we need, we need to not shy away from the fact that we are still learning and to be the excellent teachers that we are and leaders that we are, we need to keep learning. I think that's a really key skill and a message we need to send to our students. Also, I think that we need to make sure that, I always say we've got to have cutting edge professional development. Um, thinking about cars, we, we don't pour orange juice in our cars and expect them to run. You know, we pour quality petrol and fuels into our car. Professional development is the same. We need to give our teachers the right fuel, the right, the right mental fuel to be cutting edge teachers. We can't expect our learners to be world-class learners without our teachers being world-class teachers. So it's really important that we get that right, because we, if we don't get that right, we're not gonna get the learning right in the classroom. 
Um, we need to treat people like professionals. We need to, it's something that, that Devin said in the last talk, actually, making sure that professional development is done with people and not felt like it's done to you. And actually you're part of that and you have a, a responsibility for it because actually certainly here in the UK, that's part of the teacher standards to continually update your own professional development, not just wait until somebody says this is happening tonight, but actually going out of your own way. So how can we make sure we, we do that as, as leaders and as schools to actually create a culture of learning within the adults in the building, all of the adults in the building, not just the leaders, not just the teachers, but all of the adults in our building, because ultimately as educators, we're there to improve and develop people, no matter how old they are. Um, and then lastly, kind of this idea of, of, of building on the ed tech boom, um, you know, that actually the learning can be and should be for adults and for teachers anytime, anywhere. So how can we, how can we take advantage of the innovations the different technology, the different opportunities so that we don't have to wait three weeks for a professional learning session in school. If I want to learn about questioning tonight, I can because I've got the tools to do that and there shouldn't be any barriers in front of teachers who want to learn. So that, that's my passion for professional learning in terms of teacher training. Perfect. Thank you very much, John. I think we touched upon a lot of interesting points already. MIT professor Peter Senge said, the 21st century teacher has to teach what he doesn't know because change is happening so fast. So what is the knowledge and skills that teachers in the 21st century need to have in this changing environment? And what should they be experts in? Peter, you want to kick us, kick us off? Why not? Uh, thank you, John. That was very uh, passionate and inspiring. I totally agree with you, just to say that to begin with. And um, I mean, firstly, of course, they need to be experts in their topic, whatever they teach. In, in, in Finnish primary schools, you tend to teach everything. But when you go higher, of course, you need to update your knowledge continuously. So hopefully you have the passion and motivation, what John was saying, so that you can give the latest info for the for your students too and um, about the skills I mean I, like I mentioned that creativity is one of my my passion areas you need it in not just in arts and music but everything you do in life and um, my mission statement for ALO Finland is actually cultivating curiosity creativity and future innovators so uh, if the teachers can have a little bit of that, little bit of that spark of those young kids who are born curious, then we are already on a winning side. So, um, but uh, John was already mentioning it, uh, that you need to create the culture and also Carolina, that you have to be trusted professional to be able to push yourself and also to allow yourself to make mistakes and not be penalized about it. Only that way you can actually innovate and um, feel creative, be, be brave to be a risk taker. John, do you want to add anything? What, yeah, so, uh, I, I, what should I, I, be teachers I, experts in? Yeah, I, I agree what Pearl said there about, about kind of needing to be an expert in your subject first. And I think that, that, you know, that's a given and we've had that. And interestingly, I think that through my 20 years in teaching, I've seen that we've had to be experts in our subject and we've had to be experts in classroom craft in terms of engaging students and being able to, um, you can't just bring an expert in from industry and expect them to be able to teach some of your most difficult students. There is a, there is a craft in doing that. However, one thing that I think we have not really touched and it, it, it led me to my frustrations of writing a book about it, that it we, we haven't really understood enough about the science of learning and how, how human beings or students actually learn and retain information. And only recently, very recently really, we're finding that things like retrieval practice, spacing, interleaving, um, cognitive load, dual coding, all of those things are starting to actually filter down to the mainstream classroom now. But in my, in my experience over the last few years, there hadn't been topics that, the everyday classroom teacher knew about um, and, and, and lots of the lots of the research had been written years and years ago you look at Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve 1885 it was written yet I'm talking to teachers about it right now and they're going oh 
oh wow and they're they're kind of just realizing and learning that actually you know what you teach 90 percent of what you teach students will be forgotten within the first two weeks and teachers are like wow really yeah <laughs> and, and this has been around for like 120 years and people are like like it's blowing my mind so we really need to get better at understanding what should be our core business how students retain information how they process information when you know from a, from a cognitive load point of view when it's too much all those types of things that i don't think we've done anywhere near enough of and so i wrote the i wrote a book because i was so frustrated well first of all i thought that I, I'd been a, a fraud and that everyone else knew it apart from me. So I was kind of like going into conversations saying, oh, do, do you know about this as well? And they were saying, no, no, I didn't know it either. And I thought, oh, okay, it's not just me. So I wrote this book out of frustration that the research is out there, but my teachers that taught me didn't use that. I would have, I would have liked to have used those techniques when I first started teaching. And the teachers that teach my own kids, I think, need to know it as well. So it was out of that frustration that I feel we all need to get better at that because there are some key fundamental areas that, as teachers, we really should know about. Um, and unfortunately, it is, um, it's certainly not mainstream enough that I think it's embedded in our practice yet. We're getting there, but slowly. Before people ask you, what's the name of the book, the title? Teaching Rebooted. So it really talks about the mistakes that we've made, the kind of uh -huh. teaching 1.0, what we've already done, it goes through all of those areas that I talked about, breaks down some research, and then says, here are four ideas for every bit of research that we can put into our practice. So it's, it's, a, it's hopefully a really simple, succinct guide so you don't have to troll through all the research. I've done that for you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, following up a little bit on your idea of what's the core business of teachers, um, Carolina, what, what's the role of teachers in the 21st century? Well, um, I think that teachers uh, should be definitely change drivers. And on the other hand, life learning facilitators. You know, uh, there's this uh, model of uh, education, the, the traditional model of, you know, teaching led classrooms. Um, I think that uh, has, to, has to change. And, and no matter the effort, sometimes it's, it's really hard. We need our teachers to bring joy into the learning, to empower our students, to make the, the, the classroom a safe, uh, a safe place where students um, can, can be willing to, to take risks, to uh, help them create a leadership, uh, to invite them to, to express their voice in the classroom. Why not in the whole uh, teaching and learning uh, process? In a way, it's, it's uh, being, you know, leading these uh, co-constructive uh, process of, of learning, learning together, making connections, um, uh, thinking about different ways through creativity, curiosity, soft skills, on how to get students hooked all the time because it's impossible you know to to have a successful uh, lesson if your students are not engaged and if you are talking 100% uh, of the time or most of the time and they are just there sitting and, and listening and we know as as john said you know there's a uh, there's a wide range of, of uh, supporting new tools uh, in terms of uh, digital um, technology. However, we still have teachers, you know, using technology uh, with the teacher-led uh, model. So we need to change that. And that's why I think um, it's super important uh, for teachers to become change drivers and lifelong uh, learning uh, facilitators. Thank you very much, Carolina. John, at Arete Learning Trust, what are you doing as an organization to help your teachers create an environment of lifelong learning? One thing we're, we're just about to launch, actually, this, this coming academic year, which for us starts in September, is um, we're creating a, a, a digital platform, like a, a website, but it's going to be mobile first, so we're going to really try and launch it as an app, where we're going to be able to, a bit like um, a social timeline, have all of our, because we have three schools in our trust across kind of North Yorkshire, have all of our subject teachers from different subjects in groups so they can share, they can talk about ideas and they can actually um, you know, share great practice and do that kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning. But also we can then drop in reading articles, articles we've seen, blogs, um, videos, books, and we can make learning feel more social because there's not it's interesting that not many people would want to email the whole staff 
what they've done in a lesson and how, how good it's been, but they might put it on that social platform and put a picture on as you would do with Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So making learning more social and making it feel more because then people can like it. And again, you wouldn't reply to somebody and just say with a thumbs up, but liking an article or liking something that someone's put on demonstrates, I think we're trying to um, use the culture that's there that we know as adults we are familiar with in terms of our own learning. Um, things like, you know, I know if I don't know how to do something, what do I do? I probably Google it or go to YouTube and watch a walkthrough on it. So how can we then transfer the same ideas into our professional learning so that our adults and our, our teachers can learn in that kind of social way, again, when they want to, you know, on their phone, from their pocket, or when they're sat on the toilet or lying in bed, it doesn't matter. What matters is it they have chosen when to learn. We haven't forced it upon them at a certain time. They have decided that they have got some headspace sitting in the garden, sitting in bed, wherever it is, doesn't matter. The conditions are right for them to learn. So we need to make sure that happens. So trying to make it as social and as accessible as possible uh, and really getting that buy-in to so that people almost don't see like they're learning, which I suppose is a trick that we use or not a trick, but um, a method we use with students as well, don't we, to, you know, to engage them in their learning as well. Yeah. No, that's great. So in a, in a way, really, again, to co-create, right, amongst the colleagues, just sharing what works for me, and, and, and then maybe somebody else can, can build upon that. Karina, in a previous reschool event, I had the pleasure to discuss with Cognitive's group well-being director. So I got the impression that teacher well-being is at the heart of your organization. Um, can you share some of the strategies you use to make sure teachers have the needed skills to teach efficiently in the 21st century? Well, indeed, Sven. Um, actually, um, Cognitas, you know, is a worldwide organization with uh, nearly 90 um, schools around the world. And well-being is uh, at the heart of it, you know, and uh, we have a global director. And um, since well-being is so important, and this is something that we already uh, discussed way before the, the pandemic, but now is, is you know, uh, critical. Um, the idea is that we involve the whole community uh, by supporting teachers uh, and staff with their well-being in order to support our students. Because we all know that uh, in the end, teachers are the stars. Teachers are the ones who need to be, you know, um, better prepared to be better teachers. And the social emotional aspect is extremely uh, important uh, to have a healthy and safe environment uh, for our students because they are in our care. Now, um, obviously, in order to achieve this, we have personalized talks. Uh, we have school to school uh, projects. We have a platform where all of our uh, teachers and uh, supporting staff can be able to connect with each other. Lots of uh, professional learning um, communities, teams, where they exchange uh, best practice. And we have a systematic um, you know, um, way of uh, embedding embedding and fostering this culture of uh, well-being because in the end um, you care for me and I care for you and in order to do that there's uh, you know we take into account specific um, specific topics or uh, contributors uh, which we uh, share with the community and through the different initiatives teachers carry out with the students, with parents, uh, etc. Now, um, it's very important uh, to take into account also that uh, in sharing well-being, we also have um, a worldwide event once a year the entire Cognita global community collapses in by the end of September to celebrate well-being, apart from all these um, initiatives. Are you also using your platform uh, where you share experiences amongst teachers for, for joint learning experiences? Yes, indeed. So the, 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 the nice thing about um, the platform is that you can join any any community you will feel like you know so there's like uh, 
digital learning communities, well-being communities, uh, math teachers communities, uh, primary, early years, etc. And there's also uh, self-paced learning um, modules you can take freely. So it is more or less um, what John was mentioning, you know, like learning whenever I want, whenever I can. That, that, that's, sure. you know, in the end, uh, what, what uh, really uh, helps nowadays. Perfect. Thank you very much, Carolina. Pirjo, Elo Finland is offering, according to your website, digital teacher training on Finnish education 2.0. Tell us more about it. Yeah, thank you. Hey, um, just to add to Carolina's comment, I, uh, I like to say that happy teacher is a kid teacher. And if you can build that social emotional connection to kids, it's so much easier to teach if they like you and the opposite if they don't and um, but yeah about ALO Finland it's um, I like to think that it's well well let me start where it started because I used to teach in Brussels in the European school and I was the only Finnish teacher there so every of course everyone came to ask me that what is the secret? And I was just like, well, I don't know. I'm kind of born with it. I can't put my finger on it. So <laughs> I was asking you what's the secret. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I started to dig in deeper and I, a couple of the teachers came to visit the schools with me and it was a good eye opener for me also because they saw it with, from an outsider point, point of view. And um, it was one of them who is now a principal back in Ireland who said that why there isn't a, an online opportunity for this, because it's expensive to fly to Finland, stay in hotels, eat out, and it's quite difficult to find the schools also, because since the first visa, we've had thousands, and some of the schools in Helsinki, sure. thousands of visitors, they close their doors, not because they don't want to meet all the educators, but they wouldn't be teaching anymore if they took them all in. So. Fair, fair enough for them. So, uh, of course, my response was like, yeah, right, I'm going to build it. And then I thought about it more. And, and I was like, that's actually a great, great idea. Of course, it's not quite the same when you walk in there and you really feel and sense the atmosphere, etc. But with plenty of photos, videos, little bit of um, explaining what our curriculum is, but more to show how how it happens in our schools and classrooms. Because whatever curriculum you have, it's the upper level uh, planning, isn't it? But how you implement it is the crucial part. That's where it either fails or succeeds. So, um, and teachers are the ones who really make that magic happen in, in classrooms. So, uh, so I wanted to do that. And uh, so far, so good. I got uh lovely courses on that flip classroom coding and um, and competencies and we be policy and you, if you know about flip classroom we flip it twice in finland and then we have gamified mathematics and 21st century competencies every single country are talking about them they don't vary too much they might name them differently but when you compare to elsewhere they are about the same creativity critical thinking etc so, so there. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So it's a window uh, to the world, from Finland to the world, to, to share some of the secrets uh, why Finnish schools tend to have good outcome in, in standardized tests. Indeed. And actually, can I just quickly add sure. that it's all of those um, examples, they don't work just in Finland. I like to think that whatever you do locally, can quite easily be implemented globally, meaning elsewhere. And I've had quite many teachers in India, actually, who have taken the, taken the courses. And I love it when they come back to me. I don't want to give them a teacher manual, follow step one, step two, step three, that is just dead boring. But just to give them idea that you could do this, like in Finland, we had a climate change project and the kids built a snowman snowmen next to a road to protest that if if we don't look after the climate we won't have snow soon of obviously you can't really do that in india can you but you can do something else and and there's been many times when 
I haven't even thought about it that yeah you can use the same methods here or there and everywhere and this is what learning should be and, and creative not just creative learning but creative teaching yeah thank you very much I think the pandemic has shown us that many of today's kids are much more tech savvy than than we as adults right and many pupils probably have skills teachers might be able to learn from so wouldn't it be great if schools were not only a place where teachers uh, teach kids, but also teach, uh, kids uh, would teach uh, their teachers? Uh, how could we use children's curiosity and interest to impulse teacher learning? Carolina, any thoughts? Uh, interesting. <laughs> I think here we have as teachers um, we have a huge challenge and I would say let go of control and um, because we as teachers are kind of control freaks you know so uh, letting go of control uh, is something that um, would give uh, children space you know mm -hmm. uh, space to participate to um, to to say things and and on the other hand um, it's important for us as teachers to know our students because we have a, a classroom of well 30 something here in Chile but it's important to to know each one of our students their interests for example at the beginning of the year uh, through a survey asking parents and then um, um, sort of having a specific uh, space in the schedule so they can share that because uh, that makes them feel, you know, um, interested, uh, curious to know, to know more about my, my classmate and even my teacher um, and, and be uh, active participants in the lesson and willing to share ideas, take, take, take risks and, and many other things which we now need, you know, not, not just the not just the teacher talking. Pierre, you want to, to add anything to that? How we can use children's creativity to, to trigger um, teachers' learning? Well, sometimes I feel like I would be a millionaire if I could take at least a little bit of their creativity and energy levels too. Um, I I mean, coding lesson was a good I. Um, Good example. I mean, of course, I was the one who taught them the basics, but they were actually teaching the, all of the teachers also the basics of coding. This idea came when um, the latest curriculum, it introduced coding and most of the teachers were panicking that how on earth I'm going to teach that I have not, no, no idea about it. So, um, and in primary and secondary level, it's fairly simple. So. I just wanted to give them a door opener. So that was good and kids loved it. And um, and quite often we, in Finland, we have this called, thing called phenomenal learning, which is quite often misunderstood that Finland is definitely not getting rid of subjects, even if it's quite often written elsewhere, <laughs> it's not true. So, uh, but phenomenal learning means that you ask the kids or you just kind of find out what their interests are and what their passions are like this year i've been teaching preschoolers and uh, they're really sporty and i mean super energetic i'm naked after every day but um, they uh, they chose the theme of olympics and they organized olympics for the rest of the school and today we visited the olympic stadium i mean i didn't just learn for them but i learned with them by visiting places and they ask me questions and why are they five different colors and why is it on a white back black um, white background so then we just study together john anything else yeah one of the um, one of the best examples that i can uh, refer to here in the uk are uh, lots of schools have now uh, digital leaders who are kind of student leaders you know, so so teams of students in school who are trained as digital leaders and um, they are selected based on their interest in kind of maybe you know, we've been talking about digital technology haven't we so maybe they are experts in um, google docs in slides in excel in power, whatever it may be video editing 
and actually the best examples I've seen are where they have um, schools almost have a directory of what those student what their expertise is their students and teachers can book a session with one of the students you know I want to do some project-based learning and we're going to do some video editing but I don't know where to start right I'm booking and I'm booking an hour with this student who's going to show me and tell me and give me a 60 minute tutorial on how I can use my iPad to do the recording, the editing, the making it into a, you know, something really, really nice. So that's been where I found it the, the, the kind of best examples. And then those students are also used to uh, teach younger students, um, maybe not as maybe not in replace of the classroom teacher, but doing assemblies about e-safety and, and, and going into primary schools you know, to talk about that. And I think it, it, what it does, it, it not only helps the teachers because it upskills the teachers, but it, it's amazing for those students to be, you know, puffing their chest out and I'm a digital leader and I've been teaching this in, we're, we're creating tomorrow's leaders, tomorrow's teachers, you know, we're giving them the, the expertise, the confidence. Um, and isn't that amazing that, that we can, we can, um, we can identify skills in young people that we need ourselves, and we can call on them. And I've seen that used also, I've also seen it used where they've been used when a computer is, you know, not working and they can, you know, a digital leader comes along and just goes tick, 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 you haven't done this and it works again. And we go, oh, brilliant. And the digital leader goes, there you go, miss, there you go, sir. And, you know, there's lots of ways that we can use those teams. Um, and I think it, it's great skills for them as well. So, yeah, I mean, and that's happening quite a lot, certainly in the UK, I, I suspect globally as well in terms of digital leaders. And there's quite a few, if people are watching and, and thinking, I'd like to get involved in that. There are quite a few actually accredited kind of schemes and platforms, I think, where they can get digital badges and they can kind of you know, work towards certain standards as well. So if you are interested in that, certainly look that up and look about how your school can you know, get involved with some digital leaders and you can train up some of your students because we all know every school will have a group of kids who would be amazing immediately at some of those things. So yeah, de de definitely have a look at that. That that's a wonderful that's a wonderful idea. Uh, we we talked a little bit about peer learning, right? Then learning amongst teachers. Uh, maybe Carolina, you can you can share a little bit more more of the things you are doing at Cognito, how to foster organizational learning between your teachers, because you have the wonderful opportunity to do that even globally, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, well, as I was mentioning before, Stan. Um, for us, it's been um, even before the, the, the pandemic and, and this whole, you know, uh, teams, uh, teams creation and platform, we were always thinking about how to make the most of uh, being um, a global, um, you know, organization, because we not only uh, think about, you know, being uh, 100 teachers, but thousands of teachers. And there is so much wealth, so much uh, knowledge that uh, can be shared. So um, in doing so, we are constantly um, driving initiatives um, across the world through these um, teams and professional learning networks. And, and all teachers can be involved. Now, at a, at a local level, for example, um, we have teachers from different, perhaps, sections of the schools and different schools. Remember, um, there are 14 schools here in Chile. Um, being part of a, of a network and uploading um, initiatives, videos of lessons to help each other. And now um, we, we also thought about, since you know, digital learning is so important and, and critical, we are launching our first um, global edtech um, conference uh, called the School of the Future in September for Cognita students and teachers. Three days, you know, uh, the whole Cognita community, um, you can all obviously join us as, as an audience as well, um, by showing and exchanging students projects, teacher projects and different talks, round tables and plenaries, uh, because you know this, this is something that involves the entire community. So we're gonna be obviously working around six topics, gamification, robotics, artificial intelligence, uh, extended reality um, and uh, digital learning, uh, digital culture. 
but it's a way to have everybody uh, being connected, but at the same time, learning and growing together. That, that is something uh, we are very excited uh, about. And as I said before, uh, we have thousands of teachers. So um, it's, it's really um, a great um, idea to, to work all together and to try to learn and, and face the challenges this you know, post-pandemic world uh, has, has put on, on the table. Isn't it wonderful uh, the opportunities that technology is, 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 is giving us to, to drive that global learning? John, your thoughts on peer-to-peer -peer learning. You mentioned already the platform you're building. How many schools are you at your trust? Just three at the moment. Um, but I, what, what currently, where we want to get to, you know, that, that's, I suppose, the vision. And she's articulated that beautifully in terms of how staff can come together, share projects, learn from each other. And that's ultimately what my vision is to, to, you know, to, to get to. And I think that rather than rather than sharing any more ideas, because I think that Caroline has got some great ideas that everyone can take with her. What I want to unpick a little bit and just kind of talk a little bit about is that authenticity that that brings. The fact that another teacher who teaches some of the students you teach or teaches in your schools or your area is doing something and, it, and, it, and it, it's not coming from a hierarchy of somebody saying above saying you must do this. It's, it's a real authenticity of it being shared on the ground, peer to peer. And I think that's where it becomes really, really powerful um, because there is, you know, nobody's selling anything for any other reason than actually, listen, this just works in my classroom, <laughs> like, you know, give it a go. And I think there's a real, real kind of, um, you know, authenticity and power about that. Um, and, 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 and that's why, you know, when we don't just take a salesperson's word for it, we, we, you know, we, we want to find out what someone else who's already bought that product thinks about it. That's why reviews are so important. So that's that, that this authenticity works, isn't it? Because of that. And I think also there's something called, which if, if people are listening, they don't know to search called the curse of knowledge. So the more you know about something, the harder it is to teach it to a novice because you, it, it, it feels so easy to you because you've been doing it for ages, you're an expert, and it's very difficult to teach someone else. Somewhere. But if you're also a novice and you're also learning it at the same time, that person generally can probably explain it better than an expert because they are going through the same thought processes, the same barriers, they're hitting the same roadblocks. So they can actually say, ah, oh, I know what you're probably feeling right now, or I, I, I did that as well. Whereas when you become an expert, you sometimes get a little bit too distant from that. And, and I think that having people who are learning it and, and trying new techniques in the classroom, helping other people who are doing the same at the same time, I think is really, really important because it then creates that, that real quality learning um, of people at the same kind of stages. Um, and I think sometimes that authenticity really shines through. So the things that, that Karen has, has described there are, are brilliant. And I feel that that's exactly where we want to be and certainly that's exactly where we're heading and I would say that would be kind of fantastic practice for anybody watching or listening to think how can we do that irrespective of how big or how small our organization is it doesn't matter whether you're one school whether you're 50 schools the scale is just bigger but the operation and the thinking behind sharing and peer-to-peer -peer learning is exactly the same so I would urge anybody to to, to, to look at that and, and, and try and replicate that in some way shape or form in your organization. Thank you very much, Pierre. You want to add anything to peer-to-peer -peer learning? Uh, I mean, well, your platform uh, is a peer-to-peer -peer learning at the end of the day, right? Indeed, it's, indeed, it, it is. And, to... uh, and like I mentioned uh, earlier that I don't want it to be just local, but I'd love to make it global. And uh, I already have educators. I mean, I, I find it inspiring and fascinating how similar we are in, in the ways we think and learn and teach wherever wherever you go and we and the educators you talk with and and like I mentioned already earlier about the 21st century competencies which most of the countries are talking about that they also very similar so there is already global education out there but it could be even more so and to the grassroots level too and um, authenticity is definitely a beautiful thing it's it's real and I think it works whatever you do, whether you teaching or or else. And also, John was mentioning that 
I mean, coding lessons was was all about peer to peer learning, and um, the kids also use the same same language. So it's a bit more simplified than what adults would would use. So it, it makes it easier. And when you do peer to peer learning, they also deepen their own knowledge. Like these little coding ambassadors, they did it for three years until they went to secondary. Hopefully they continue there. And because they got so into it themselves, they carried on to robotics and they took part in um, robotic competitions and they came second and third in the national ones in the following years. So there's plenty of evidence to show that it works. It's, it's, it works both ways, I mean. Perfect, thank you very much. Before we come to, to some questions from our audience, I would like to ask each of you for one idea, one practical advice. Um, what could each of us do tomorrow morning at our school to surprise our pupils and increase their learning motivation? Switching a little bit from learning of of teachers to learning from to to our students. Pirjo, you want to do you want so to give I it a try? Yeah, why not? Well, I already said that be a risk taker and fail, learn and fail again. And uh, ask the kids, ask the kids sometimes that what is it that you want to learn more, or is there a topic that you could you would like, love to learn that we haven't really touched yet? Uh, or are they really good at something that they could teach to others? This way you can also build that beautiful learning co community, not just in your classroom, but in the whole school. So maybe that. Thank you very much, John. Uh, one thing I would say is one of my bugbears when I kind of uh, watch teachers is, is improving our questioning because I think far too many teachers re, 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 you know, use default questioning techniques with students with hands up so actually lots of kids can then just check out of the lesson and what i would call mentally truant because they know that you're only going to ask students with their hands up so so going to your question about how we would surprise them well actually you know having a hands down approach of i'm going to ask a question i'm going to actually pick who answers this question and really being really more effective and you know, Douglas Love calls this kind of cold calling so that every single person has to be thinking in your classroom because they don't know who you're going to pick to answer that question. And suddenly, the amount of deep thinking, the quality of thought, uh, the challenge, the rigor in the classroom, and the quality of your questioning hugely improves because actually the students don't know who it's going to be. They can't just you know put their hands in their pockets and think, if I keep my hands down, I won't need to think this lesson. So really challenging the students that they have to be thinking at all points. And then if we add things to that, and when we can do this a little bit better when we're not when we're out of COVID, but walking around the classroom and using your presence. And as you walk around and ask a question and stand behind a student, that student is then thinking, oh, it could be me, it could be me, it could be me. And they're starting to think and think and using all of those skills in your armory to get all students to be thinking because they don't know who's going to be asked. And it's not about them deciding whether or not to think. They have to because you're in charge and you're going to actually work out, you know, and, and ask who's, who's going to answer that question. So definitely brushing up on our questioning. And for me, that's one of the biggest things in our armory as teachers. Yeah, hopefully all students around the world will be back to school very, very soon. Carolina, do you, you close the round? <laughs> well, um, I, I find super interesting what Piryu and, and John uh, have just said. I think I would definitely um, do something in order to provoke um, my students' uh, curiosity. Now, um, this is not easy. Uh, however, if you if you think about doing something at the beginning of the lesson, you know, perhaps sharing um, like a glimpse of what is going to come, um, um, asking the, the the five wise questions, uh, for example. Uh, which will keep them hooked. I think I would definitely go for that, you know, um, provoking um, curiosity in order to have them hooked and with me all the time. Perfect. Thank you very much. With this, um, I would pass on the word to Christina uh, with some questions from the audience. Good afternoon. So um, questions, uh, the one, I think that this goes for Carolina. Letting go of control is something this teacher, whose name is Alison, thinks about often. 
does education maintain status quo in attracting people with certain personality types? Uh, how do we shift that particularly in urban areas serving the most needy kids? Well, <laughs> that is a big question. It is. Um, yeah, especially uh, considering, you know, the, 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 the context um, you're mentioning. Um, I would say that um, this is something, obviously, letting, letting go of control is not something you as a teacher can do uh, from one day to the next. It, it is a whole process in which you have to um, sort of learn together with your students by giving them space and uh, gaining their, their trust. And you, uh, at a certain point, being, uh, being, being a, a bit humble, you know? Humble because you don't have all the answers. You, you cannot uh, manage all the, um, the situations, all the factors, uh, all the elements that um, take place in a, in a classroom. So um, no matter what the context, I would say is thinking about children, thinking about students and the importance of their voice. Um, when you are willing to hear students' voice, you're letting go of uh, control at some point. I, I hope I, I could answer at some point uh, uh, my colleague's uh, question. Yeah, well, this was the learn to listen that Carol Allen on the other uh, round table said, so great. And okay, this links to another question. How can we give a space to students with the tight schedules they have to meet the curriculum? How much time would you recommend to get this off control or, or would it, this something be, you know, within the way you teach? Well, in the case, for example, in the case of our country, we all know that there's countries where, uh, you know, the, the curriculum might be super flexible, uh, whereas other countries, and that's the case in, in Chile, uh, we have a rigid structure uh, curriculum with, you know, subjects with a certain number of hours and we, we don't have much space to, to move. However, what you can do is not, I mean, giving that space within your own classroom, you know? And this might be, I don't know, perhaps just by uh, shooting something at the beginning of the lesson, you know, like uh, checking prior knowledge instead of, okay, today we are going to learn uh, so-and-so and it will just take you a couple of minutes, but you will realize about how much you can gain as a, as a, as a community in the classroom by giving the students the chance Wow, very interesting. Uh, Piercio, this one goes for you. The curriculum implementation is a matter of teachers, you said, but uh, do, do the government policies help? I guess that uh, this person says that, I guess that in Finland, this might be different, right? <laughs> I mean, not all the countries uh, have their governments for, or, you know, that align to them, you know, in terms of education. Sorry, did I understand the question that is the curriculum flexible enough so that you can do? Well, uh, yeah, because in some countries, I guess that this was the question, uh, the curriculum is very tight and, and yeah. uh, you know, very strict and they can, and, and, and it's not that flexibility uh, possible. This, this flexibility is not that possible. No? And, and you say um, the way the, the, the the way the curriculum is implemented is something that has to be with the teachers, right? But not, I don't think that um, this is that easy in certain countries. How can we do it if the curriculum is tight and you have to meet it and, you know, and you don't have enough hours? <laughs> because yeah. Finland is yeah. like, a, you know, an isolated world and then becomes the other part of the world. Right? Yeah, it is true. It is true. And, and that is a great point. However, it is more, Finnish teachers are given more autonomy because they are considered as uh, trusted professionals. However, you still need to do the certain amount of subjects, but younger you are, more flexibility you have. That, for instance, today, if I can see that the kids are learning mathematics, then they're really willing to learn. 
a teacher can decide that, okay, let's do this. And then tomorrow we dig into whatever else is there. It is true that it's a lot wider. It, it, our national curriculum is like a broad framework within okay. the lines. Teachers have a lot of freedom to choose the methods and um, variety of methods and tools, how they teach the kids in their schools and classrooms. Because of course it varies every single year. So it's not so, you don't follow so, so tight then, then this I is the could difference. even call a teacher <laughs> manual, but however, so now what, we know the secret. Yeah. So what what Carolina was also saying that it doesn't have to be a massive change. I don't think anyone is asking to flip into being a Finnish teacher or or an innovator in one baby steps and see the change, how it might spark the curiosity and also creativity both in you and, and, the, and the learners too. And you might find out that those kids, they actually suck in the information a lot faster and more effectively just by doing those little tweaks in your teaching and learning. Because I don't think anywhere, and, and like I mentioned earlier, everywhere they are talking about 21st century competencies. So if you can prove them wrong, that this curriculum, if I follow it step by step, you might lack in elsewhere. Mm. And, and, and the last question goes for John. Uh, wouldn't it be good to have a teacher training session on how they learn? I mean, you talked about this and any recommendation on, for an, of an online course or, or, or a book or anything, please? Yeah, well, and I think that certainly, I, I, I don't want to bash teacher training here, but I think that teacher training should include a lot more of this because I think it's at the core fundamentals of who we are as educators. We need to understand how human beings, children, etc., etc., learn information, process information, how we can use the desirable difficulties to make things just hard enough, you know, the kind of Goldilocks approach of just at the right level to make sure it's hard enough for them to be able to, you know, to, 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 um, you know, to, 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 to make the biggest differences the conditions in which we learn. There's so many things around what I call the science of learning, I think is, is really important. So there are lots of different kind of courses out there that I think people are, and lots of different books there. Like I say, I've, I've wrote, I wrote my own book on that out of my own frustration that I felt that, like I said at the start, that I felt like I was a fraud because I, I thought I was the only person that didn't know this. And actually it turns out that not many people knew it. So I kind of wrote that. So if people want to look, look for my book, it's Teaching Rebooted. But equally, you look at just search for the science of learning, look for, you know, metacognition or dual coding, um, uh, spacing, retrieval. There are so many books out there. And what's lovely about the explosion of really digital technology, I suppose, has helped this is that when I then started blogging and tweeting about things, and I had a platform to do that. And I had a platform to share it with educators around the world. I think because of that, there are so many now authentic teachers who are still teaching, writing books for fellow teachers. Um, and, and gone are the days now where it has to just be people from, you know, kind of university or researchers writing those things. People are writing them now at the chalk face. And I think that's really, really important. And I think that creates that authenticity again. So, you know, if you are wanting to do some of that reading, you know, there's some amazing books out there. Have a look at what's out there because there's some really cutting edge texts now that are out there from, um, you know, from current practitioners that, that cite a lot of the research that's been written in the past, but with maybe more of a practical or an up-to-date spin on it. Thank you. In fact, your book was recommended in the chat. So <laughs> that's all for, for tonight. Thank you, Sven. I Perfect. Can to you. Carolina, Pirjo, John, thank you so much. It has been a true pleasure um, uh, guiding together Finland, the UK, and Chile to, to co-create and, and to share your experience and your vision.